and their applications, different types of pit and fissure sealants, indications and contraindications, where we use them and where we do not use these materials. And how we use uh, sealants in clinics or in laboratory. Uh, this is part of a practical session. And then we will conclude the lecture uh, and we can have question answers about this lecture. So what are pit and fissure sealants? To understand that, we have to understand what are pit and fissure. So this is from your dental anatomy and tooth morphology knowledge. So I have briefly put and define what is pit and what is fissure. So this is pit which you can see pinpoint depressions on the occlusal or occlusal table or chewing surface. We all do understand that the chewing surface or occlusal surface of molars and premolars is not flat. So it has curves, it has various pits and fissures. Similarly, fissures are shallow lines or grooves between parts of the crown. So these are the fissures or grooves which we can see. And pit and fissure sealant is a material Richard? that we use. Yes. Uh, there is a student, a student in waiting room. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, okay, just one more student. Okay, right. So pit and fissure sealant, a material that is introduced, which means that is placed on the occlusal table, on the occlusal surface to seal these pits and fissures. If you see this tooth, these are fissures, pit, and here is application of sealant. So this is a protective technique in which we place an adhesive sealant material to seal these pits and fissures. So there is a question why we need to apply pit and fissure sealant, what is the benefit? So let's talk about uh, the benefit is we use this material as a preventive measure to prevent teeth from caries. As we all know, the caries mostly in the occlusal surface. If we see this uh, cross section of a tooth and you see the pit or fissure is a deep area which is difficult to clean. Even, even if patient brush, this area sometimes is not clean and plaque stays there. So due to stagnation of this plaque, this area is prone to caries and dental caries can uh, start from pits and fissures. So that is why we have most of cases of dental caries in pits and fissures. So therefore, this material has an application to prevent teeth from dental caries. Uh, doctor? Yes. Uh, there is a student in the waiting room. I can, uh, okay, yes, there is one more student, okay. Yeah, admitted. Okay, so what are the ideal properties? This slide is very important. We need to understand what properties we need in a material that we use as a pit and fissure sealant. So first of all, it should be biocompatible. So now you can recall your lecture from first term and you can understand biocompatibility mean. It should be non-toxic. It should not react in the oral cavity. should release fluoride because fluoride prevents from caries. So if a material will release fluoride, it will be good. It will prevent from dental caries. So in that regard, glass enamel is a better option. Low viscosity, it should be thin. So it can flow in narrow uh, grooves and narrow pits. If it is not low viscosity, it will not flow into the narrow grooves. Adhesion to enamel, 
we should have good adhesion with enamel. Otherwise, this material will be peeled off and enamel will be exposed to dental caries. Adequate retention. It should stay there for at least few years. Reasonable working time and easy to use. Good mechanical properties, good wear resistance. And properties similar to enamel. So we desire like white color looks like an enamel in color and translucency. So it should not look very bad. Low solubility or it should not dissolve in uh, saliva or oral fluids. Because if it dissolve or soluble, it will wash out and cost effective. <clears throat> it should not be very expensive. Uh, that cost effective mean it should be cheaper. Right, so there are two main types which are used as a pit and fissure sealant. One is glass isomer and one is composite resins. So first we start with glass isomers. Glass isomers, similar as we discussed earlier, glass isomers can be used, can be used as a, a, a sealant material. But there are certain problems, there are some benefits and some problems with using glass isomer sealant. For example, this is not very thin, its viscosity is high. So due to that, it might not flow into the pits and fissures properly. So, but the, on the other hand, it will have fluoride release property. So they are rich in fluoride, even up to 19% of fluoride can be found in glass cinema cements. So it can prevent caries by uh, release of fluoride. But due to viscosity, less retention and its brittleness, they are not commonly used. Also the mechanical properties are poor compared to resin composites. So resin composites, are the same composite materials which which you had last two lectures only there is some little modification also it comes in the uh, form of light cure and self cure so as you know in composite resins the main composite uh, main composition is bis gma which is bisphenol a glycidyl methacrylate it's it is a chemical which is present in composite resin and we add diluent to make it thin so its viscosity become low and it become flowable. And then we have activator plus light. And once we expose it to light, it become solid. As we have seen in the practical session, once we expose it to blue light, it become, it polymerize and seal the surface. In chemical cured or auto polymerized, same mechanism, but only they cure on its own with time. Once we mix in, uh, this comes in two paste system or in two bottle system. And once we mix them, the reaction starts. There is no need to expose to light. Sorry, we don't have, uh, we didn't have this one in the lab. So I cannot show you this one chemical cured. So I only provided light cured and also chemical uh, cured not commonly used. But theoretically, we should know that it, it acts by autopolymerization. There is no need of uh, light exposure in this case. So BISGMA based formulations have low viscosity due to uh, a thin viscosity. It can flow into the pits and fissures. So it is recommended. Also available in chemical and uh, self-activated both forms and comes in syringe, which I, I already shown you in the laboratory and also comes in bottle delivery system. But due to ease of use, we commonly use uh, syringe formulation because they are easy. We can simply uh, use disposable needles to dispense this material. <clears throat> so, there is a common question 
is there any difference between Peyton Fisher sealant and Peyton Fisher restoration? Uh, okay, uh, there is right. So in Pitt and Fisher sealant, we only apply and seal the Pitt and Fisher. If you see this image, we only seal like a thin line. In Pitt and Fisher restoration, only we place if there is very little caries. So we remove that caries or caries spot and seal the remaining Pitt and Fisher system. So there is very little difference in, uh, in that. Let's come to the classification of Pitt and Fisher sealants. We can classify Pitt and Fisher sealants based on various parameters. Like the first one is fluoride, either they uh, release fluoride or no. So we have fluoride, fluoridated and non-fluoridated. The resin composites are usually uh, non-fluoridated. They don't release any fluoride, but glass enamel, they release fluoride. According to color, we can have transparent or clear pink, uh, and we can have opaque or tinted. Because opaque and tinted can be visible on the uh, tooth surface and we can distinguish from enamel. While the uh, transparent and clear ones, they might not be visible on the enamel and we might have difficulty to distinguish between uh, sealant itself and tooth structure. According to fillers, we have unfilled, semi-filled and filled. Uh, filler means the filler particles which we have in the composite. So of course we will have filler particles, but their quantity can be different. Polymerization, they can be self-cure or auto-polymerized, but not commonly used. And the commonly used are light cured which are cured with the exposure of blue light. And we also have laser cured. Mm -hmm. And then we have various generations, uh, classification according to generations. Uh, previously, first generation cure on the exposure of UV, UV light. Second generation is auto cure or self cure. And third generation is uh, light cured, which we are uh, commonly using now. And fourth generation is fluoride releasing sealants. So they incorporated fluoride even in composite resin sealants. So delivery of fluoride is only due to its benefit. It can prevent from spread of caries. So here is further explanation. What is the difference between fluoridated and non-fluoridated? Of course, fluoride, fluoridated sealants can release fluoride and can make an animal more resistant to caries. Non-fluoridated may have support of topical fluoride application, or we can recommend some fluoridated toothpaste or mouthwashes to support that if it is non-fluoridated. Similarly, sealant may be clear or opaque. As I discussed, opaque, we can see the difference with enamel, but clear may be difficult to distinguish. So that is why a color may be useful. We might add some pigments or some tints in the material to look like uh, we can give some shades, some staining in the material. But this is not important because the important is like protective application of uh, this material. Similarly, filled ones, we might have up to 50% inorganic filler uh, to reduce occlusal wear. So we, because we know fillers are required for uh, improving the mechanical properties. So if we don't use fillers at all, the material will be very weak. So that is why we add some filler contents to improve the mechanical properties, especially wear resistance. And then according to polymerization, uh, the light cure and auto cured are there. So most important here is a selection of patients for Pitt and Fisher sealant application. Of course, we do not use uh, Pitt and Fisher sealant for every patient. We have to be specific which patients we will choose for 
patent fisher application. So these are five categories which are important for uh, patent fisher application. What we will see in patient history, uh, medical and dental history. This is very important. We see patients medical and dental history also. For example, if patient is having history of caries, milk teeth were carious, so that means patient is susceptible to caries and we should consider patent fissure sealant application. Similarly, some medically compromised children, we can consider application of that. Clinical examination, caries activity, and tooth age and anatomy. This we should consider for uh, application. For example, if pits and fissures are very deep, very narrow, which are difficult to clean, we can think of uh, sealant application. Similarly, if caries activity is high, for example, if a child reports with high sugar consumption, high caries rate in milk teeth, yes, we should consider pit and fissure sealant application. Similarly, we have nutritional analysis. Children who are taking sugary drinks or fizzy drinks or chocolates or certain other sweets frequently, we should consider uh, pit and fissure sealants because such patients will be susceptible to high caries. Similarly, salivary analysis, we might uh, go for biochemical analysis of saliva to look for salivary flow rate. If salivary flow, flow rate is reduced, such as hyposalivation or due to some other reason, not enough saliva, there is high chances of caries. Similarly, microorganisms or bacteria, if they're uh, high amount of microorganisms or plaque depositions, yes, we should go for that one. And finally, we do radiographic assessment. Radiographic assessment, we do uh, uh, x-rays to make sure there is no caries. Now the point here to remember and very important is we use this as a preventive measure to prevent teeth from dental caries. We cannot use it if there is active caries. So that is why radiographic assessment is essential. We make sure there is no caries. Tooth is caries free, then we decide, okay, we can apply pit and fissure sealant. If there is caries, our treatment plan is different. We should go for respiration. We should remove caries and put uh, filling. So this is all about assessment and we have some more uh, details in indications and contraindications of this uh, uh, technique. So first of all, indications where we should use this material. So these five steps will help us to choose a patient. And these conditions, we will apply pit and fissure sealant. For example, very high caries risk, where we think the rate of caries is very high. For example, there is history of uh, high caries in milk teeth. There is history of caries in parents or siblings. The nutritional or diet pattern tells us there is chances of high caries. So we will choose patients like that. Tooth is caries free. There is no evidence of caries in the teeth. And most importantly, age. We consider application for children 6 to 15 years. And also we consider children with impairment like mentally or physically retarded children where we think they are unable to uh, clean their teeth. So we can provide preventive measures. So we can prevent teeth from progression of dental caries. Now this age, I always stress this is important because at the six years we get first permanent tooth, first permanent molar. So if there is a history of high caries in milk teeth, we should immediately put pit and fissure sealant at the age of six. 
and until we see second molar comes at the age of 12 and premolars comes around 10 and 11 years old so we can put straight away pit and fissure sealants but if child is 15 years or over we cannot put pit and fissure sealant usually because there are two reasons after 15 years there will be caries in these teeth or there will be no caries so option one if there is caries we cannot place pit and fissure sealant because if there is caries we remove caries and put restoration or filling in option b if there is no caries so that means patient is not susceptible to caries so therefore there is no need of pit and fissure sealants so this is why this uh, age is important and we only uh, indicate pit and fissure sealants for this age group there can be some some exceptions like uh, if patient is negligent or visit the dental clinic after his age yes we still can consider pit and fissure sealant application contraindications where we should not use pit and fissure sealant we are all uh, clear now carious lesions if there is active caries there is cavity formation we will avoid using pit and fissure sealants proximal caries child behavior if child is not cooperative we are struggling for isolation or not cooperative we might avoid using pit and fissure sealant shallow fissures because shallow fissures are easy to clean so usually they are not susceptible to caries caries free for more than four years so what what this point mean if caries free for more than four years so for example first molar erupts at the age of six so that child comes to you at the age of 10 years with no caries will you apply pit and fissure sealant uh, yes no 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 why will you no because no. yeah because if patient Second. visits you if patient visits you at age of 10 and first molar erupts at age of six so that means for four years patient brushing is good and patient is able to keep this tooth caries free so this means there is no need so this is general guideline if it is caries free for more than four years so this means patient brushing is okay and there is no need of uh, application similarly enamel hyperplasia uh, hyperplasia and fluorosis uh, is a condition where we avoid using pit and fissure sealants because fluorotic enamel there might not be good bond with uh, enamel so how sealants are handled in a uh, dental office and how we use it in uh, in teeth so i have i hope you have good understanding in the lab session for uh, this we have seen pit and fissure sealants and how we use them uh, what was missing sometime in the lab is the protection we must use full protection for using not only pit and fissure sealants but using all the materials and this is especially important in current time where uh, COVID-19 is here as well and also from the toxicity of materials we should protect ourselves and we should use general protection such as gloves masks uh, safety glasses, protective clothing, and closed shoes. We all should use like this. And storage refrigerate uh, these materials so they don't, uh, especially here, the temperature goes up and we should use these material storage in the refrigerator. Handling with gloves, protective eyewear, these things we should use. But this is not only uh, related to pit and fissure sealant but to all the materials we should use this protection so what are the main steps for using pit and fissure sealant 
I'm sure you all have a good lab session and you have good understanding how we use Pitt and Fisher sealant or how this looks like, how it works. So the first step is we isolate the tooth, which means the tooth is isolated. It has no contamination with saliva. And then we clean the surface. We might clean the surface before isolation or we can isolate and clean the surface. There is no big difference. And dry the teeth, inspect for caries. Of course, caries inspection is clinical. We look at the tooth with the good light just to make sure there is no caries. And also we do the radiographic. We check with the x-ray that there is no caries in this tooth. And then we apply acid etching. 37% phosphoric acid. We apply, leave it there for 15 to 20 seconds. And then we remove the acid, rinse it uh, with water spray for 10 to 15 seconds. And then uh, we make it dry with oil-free air. So that process takes maybe less than one minute. This is the same process which we use for uh, resin composite restorations. Only difference is here we apply on the surface of enamel. After that, we apply the sealant uh, or bonding agent and we cure it with light according to the recommendation. Usually we use uh, 10 seconds, 10 seconds are enough. And then we apply the sealant and cure it using a light. <clears throat> Once we apply the sealant, we look for uh, evaluation. We make sure sealant is applied correctly, completely, and there is no white, there is no air bubble, there is no elevation. And then we check the occlusion. So patient should not feel any high spot, any roughness, any irritation with this material. So this is a grammatic presentation. So here we apply acid at gel. This shows we clean it, clean the tooth, apply acid at gel, wash it and dry it. After washing and drying, the enamel will appear white frosty appearance, which means the surface is ready to receive bonding agent. The etching is successful and we should apply bonding agent now. So once we apply bonding agent, we cure with light and we apply Pitt and Fisher sealant and we apply very, very thin layer, very little because in the practical session, I saw most of the students, they, they're trying to apply a huge amount. Remember, we should apply very little, maybe less than a drop, which can spread and seal the pits and fissures and then we cure it. After cure, we check for the occlusion. There is no high spot, especially if you use large quantity, you might find some spots there for which patient will not feel comfortable. So after that, you apply and uh, you make the surface polished. If you grind it, if you don't grind it, there is no need of polishing because it finishes good. And we can compare pits and fissures before application and after application. So remember in pit and fissure sealant, we don't build any filling on the surface. We just simply a thin layer to seal pits and fissures. So this slide, I usually I put in composite resin lecture, but uh, I put this slide in pit and fissure also just as a revision. So why acid etching is important? Acid etching gives us certain benefits and its effectiveness can be seen by a chalky white opaque appearance of the enamel. So if chalky white appearance is there, this means etching is successful and it gives us certain benefits. For example, if any residual plaque, any debris, it will be removed with acid etching. The surface retention will, will be improved. Because of loss of minerals, it will make surface micro roughness and micro pores. 
these microscopic undercuts and irregularities uh, in which thin resin will flow and make bond. So it, it gives micropores and spaces where resin can flow in and get locked inside for making bond. It improves all the parameters of adhesion. If you remember from our uh, previous term lecture, adhesion lecture, it improves the bonding. It improves the wetting of enamel, increases surface energy and surface area, and facilitate bonding of sealant or composite with the tooth surface. So therefore, with the acid etching, we get good bonding, strong bonding, uh, which is required and essential for uh, this kind of applications. <clears throat> okay, should I ask a question? Do Pitt and Fisher sealants fail? Is there any failure of Pitt and Fisher's sealants? Uh, no, sir. Why, why you think no? I think yes. yes. Failure or, fa or, or failure? Failure. 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 No, absolutely. There is a failure. There is failure. There is failure of everything. Everything is there to be failed. But there is a difference in time scale or, I mean, how we evaluate the success of a material. For example, we say, okay, if it works for two years, for three years, we say, okay, it is successful. But for temporary, temporary filling, we say, okay, if it works for three months, we say, okay, it is successful because it, it worked for its purpose. But permanent filling, if permanent filling works only for two months, we will not say it is success because it didn't work for its purpose. The permanent filling purpose is to work for years. So if permanent filling works for five years, we say, okay, success, because it, it did its purpose, but ultimately has to be failed. After five years, after seven years, yes. So similarly, sealants are very likely to be failed. But the main reason is lack of isolation and moisture or contamination. If we haven't applied properly, saliva can contaminate the surface which can affect the bonding. So due to this contamination or moisture contamination or slivery contamination, uh, the bond is affected and the sealant can be peeled off. Did you get this point? Or shall I explain further? Yeah. Can you repeat, Doctor? Please. Okay. 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 For example, if isolation is not good, right? You make etching, you make enamel white frosted appearance, and then patient moves tongue or your isolation is not good, and saliva contaminates the surface, your etch surface. So that will not give you a good bond. So once you apply sealant, it will, it will be applied, but after some time it will be failed. It will be removed. When patient will chew or use for mastication, it will be removed because there is no uh, very strong bond between uh, resin material itself and enamel. So this means early loss, early loss of filling and retention failure, which is a failure. Because you applied resin, uh, Pitt and Fisher sealant, and then later on it is lost. The patient didn't know it is lost and patient will not visit or come back to the dentist to show that the material is failed. So this is the only reason. And for this, the posterior teeth are uh, more likely to get contaminated. For example, mandibular molars, mandibular second molars, because that is the most difficult to, to isolate in children. So that is why it is more likely to get failed for uh, sealant application. Right, so.
So what are advantages of using pit and fissure sealants? So first of all, it is non-invasive technique. It's kind of non-surgical technique. We don't need to do any operation or any tooth cutting. We simply clean the surface and apply it. So this is the main benefit. And the protection, it gives protection to the tooth. It delay the operative procedure. For example, if patient needs uh, filling or restoration in two years due to caries, after sealing application, it patient might need after five years. So we are basically delaying the operative uh, procedure for operative time, which is the last point. Prevents marginal leakage, maintain tooth morphology uh, because it prevents from caries. So it uh, restores the tooth structure and tooth morphology. Might have a source of fluoride if we are using fluoridated resin or fluoridated material, it might release fluoride and can further protect uh, tooth from uh, dental caries. So these are the benefits uh, which we get from pit and fissure sealants. Do you think is there any disadvantage? And it doesn't work for a long time. Yes. Okay, so main disadvantage is lack of universal use. Not everyone use uh, pit and fissure sealant or not everywhere it is available. The reason behind is because it is not an essential treatment. It is only for protection. And many people, they uh, don't bother about protection and it is not related to pain also. So that is why you will find mostly uh, like hospital places and community places, this material is not available. Sometime there is very minor caries and operator does not know there is caries. So they put sealant over the caries surface, which is not a benefit, which is a loss. Because once you seal the caries surface, caries will grow and reach to the pulp. Technique sensitive, we need etching, bonding, we need isolation, we need light curing, so it needs some technique to use it. <clears throat> the caries susceptibility of etch enamel, but this is not a real disadvantage because if you cover it properly, that's fine. If you leave it uh, uncovered, yes, then there might be caries progression there. Economically unfeasible. As we uh, check in the ideal properties, it should not be expensive, it should be cheap. But mostly uh, fissure sealants are not cheap, so they are not economic or um, burden on the economy of any society. So they, that is why in the healthcare system, they are not provided or they are provided at a high cost. There is risk in uh, using etching gels. So why I, why I put in the Pitt and Fisher uh, lecture this point, because they are mostly used for children. So children are uh, very delicate tissues and if they apply, they get uh, any exposure to etching gel that can cause some uh, damage or some like burning sensation due to the acidity. So we have to use that with very proper care. So uh, the etching gel should not touch the soft tissues like gums or uh, patient's tongue and these things. <clears throat> so here it looks like after uh, application. So what do you see in this image? I can see one molar tooth, what else? Composite. Okay, composite, which is uh, fissure sealant. Yes, we can see uh, composite here. Someone tried to seal all pits and fissures as a preventive measure. What else we can see in here? Void in the proximal. Void in the proximal. So this is very important. So this is, we should check our pit and fissure sealant application once we apply it. 
So we should make sure there is no void or air bubble like this one. So if we leave this, so this is not benefit. This is uh, disadvantage because all plaque, saliva, microbacteria will gather here. And this is the point where caries will start. Very nice. What, what else you can see here in the savage? Incomplete coverage. Incomplete coverage, which is like kind of air, right? So sometimes, although we use low viscosity, we use thin material, but so sometimes it doesn't flow because pits and fissures are also very narrow. So we should make sure it flow completely and seal the surface completely. So if we leave incomplete coverage, so this is the area where patient will develop caries. So sometimes we use uh, if very, very narrow pits and fissures. We can give a little bit uh, cutting here, but usually for uh, blast enamel or make use for composite also. But mostly people avoid that because this will damage the, uh, the natural finish of the enamel. <clears throat> so we should understand this is a preventive measure. So preventive measure means this will prevent from dental caries, but still it can happen. And we should insist patient to take good oral hygiene because why we put pit and fissure sealant because uh, patient is susceptible to caries. So it does not mean they put pit and fissure sealant and caries will not be there. They still can have caries. So they should maintain good oral hygiene, dietary analysis. They should avoid using sugary drinks and sweets and use uh, proper oral hygiene care and <clears throat> use fluoride toothpaste to fight with dental caries. So this is clinical application of pit and fissure sealants. You can see pit and fissure sealers applied in all premolars and molars. Not only this one, I can see caries here in this tooth, but these applied, maybe this one missing. So we are open to questions we can discuss, but I will start with one of the question which uh, uh, one of my students asked me in the morning session. Can we apply pit and fissure sealants for anterior teeth? So the answer is no. We don't use pit and fissure sealants for anterior teeth because in anterior teeth, we need to make a good cosmetic and aesthetic appearance. And for pit and fissure sealant, we cannot have the same aesthetic because they are opaque. Their translucency is not like incisal edge. So it will not cosmetically, it will not look good. And due to low viscosity, it is difficult to give shape. For example, in size, shape of incisor, we cannot make in a low viscosity pit and fissure sealant because it will flow in all directions. So therefore, in anterior teeth or incisors, we most likely use a normal composite, bulk fill composite. Also, there are very few, only one lingual pit in the, or palatal pit in the upper incisors. So therefore, uh, pit and fissure sealant application is mainly for uh, premolars and molars. Thank you very much for uh, attending this lecture. Uh, I try to make you clear about all the points related to pit and fissure sealant applications and the material. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask. Uh, in slide uh, 60, in slide uh, 16. Okay. One second, slide 16, let me go. Can you see slides or no? Yes. Slide 16, okay, yes. Failure of Failure, sealants. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, in second point, I didn't uh, get, get it. What's meaning okay. maxillary and mandibular okay. secondary molar? Okay, I explain it for you, no problem. Okay, so remember the main cause of failure is contamination, saliva. 
so where you will find saliva and where you will difficult to uh, you will find difficult to control salivary contamination back of the mouth so back of the mouth is second molar because in children there is no third molar you get my point yes so in the back of the mouth because mouth opens wide and there is a large distance between incisors between incisors there is a big dis distance upper and lower incisors but at back of the mouth there is not a big difference and there is a narrow space where saliva flow so that is difficult to control salivary contamination in maxillary and mandibular second molar especially mandibular second molar so once we try to apply sealant most likely we get contamination in children so that is why we consider uh, this point also sometimes they as i uh, show this case for example uh, maybe i can show you on this image yes you see this one these teeth will not get saliva contamination here it will get saliva second molars they will get saliva because they are very close to tongue there is narrow space saliva can easily contaminate them but these teeth if you make it dry they will remain dry they will not get contamination from saliva of course we can use uh, cotton rolls to isolate and we can use uh, rubber dam as well so but still chances of salivary contaminations are high in second molars doctor i have a question please yeah what does established carious lesions mean okay this is a good question uh, because uh, at present i don't understand your level in second year you might not understand certain terms so feel free to ask uh, and explain anything which you do not understand okay the established caries lesion means where we see visible caries there is cavity formation sometimes caries is not visible we see only a pin point as <clears throat> if you see last slide last slide on right second molar you will see very small tiny points so this is uh, this is called incipient caries or very minor caries but established mean a big caries and there is clear cavity formation also called gross caries so there are different different types i think there are at least uh, 10 or 15 types of dental caries which you will read in oral pathology in next year susceptible susceptible to caries which means there are high chances of caries susceptible mean high chances of caries 